Let's yes. get this conversation started right away because I'm very excited to introduce Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple. Brad, thanks for joining again. Absolutely. Another Good year deal. at Davos. Absolutely. Right, <clears throat> we have a, a lot to talk about. Hey, hey, everybody. It's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And that intro, of course, was Brad Garlinghouse. And he is going to talk about in this next clip the growth years of 2021 and 2022 for Ripple. Yeah, they're processing billions of dollars. You're going to hear that half of all the transactions now are going through with XRP. They've got a lot of new corridor pairs. Now, one can find many studies about the company Amazon and their flywheel concept and virtuous cycle. It's interesting that he uses the same series of building uh, this positive virtuous cycle. Ripple introduced their flywheel concept and progress back in 2019 and 2020. So if truly half of the RippleNet clients are now using ODL, on-demand liquidity, which uses the digital asset XRP as a bridge, I'd say this flywheel is spinning pretty fast. Talk to me a bit about Ripple's business then. Uh, how was 2022 for you guys? Can you, can you give us some numbers, revenue, growth? Yeah. What, what did you see? So uh, 2021 and 2022 were both record years for us. And one of the things that's interesting about that is the SEC sued us uh, around the question of is, is XRP a security at the end of 2020. And I'll admit, the, the beginning of 2021 was a, a stressful, Q1 was a stressful quarter for sure, because you now have a lawsuit uh, in the largest economy in the world, and you didn't know how your existing customers would react, let alone new customers. And what we have seen since then, it, it particularly non-US, you know, well over 95% of the customers we've signed in the last two years are non-US. Uh, our activity is growing more and more outside the United States, and it's because you have this confusion in the United States. So we're now processing billions of dollars of transactions every quarter, uh, and you know, well over half of our total transaction volume, because we do have a fiat and XRP-enabled product called on-demand liquidity. Over half of all of our transactions go through XRP now. That has grown, and so... Again, I, we're continuing to sign more contracts, more customers, and then the co contracts and customers we have have grown, partly because we open more corridors, more currency pairs. And so there's kind of a, a, a nice series of building uh, a vir positive virtuous cycle that, that helps grow the business. Yeah. This next portion of the clip is about Ripple's leasing program. Ripple began leasing out XRP to the RippleNet members back in 2021. Now in this conversation, He's talking about the leasing program being used for the market makers, but they also use it for their clients. And it was in a public discussion about how they offer attractive rates. The lease program numbers were included in the Ripple Markets report here with millions in short lend. That was Q2 of 2022. Back in 2021, leasing was described by two Ripple employees in a presentation that it was all about improving cash flow, especially for the SMEs. That would be the small to medium-sized enterprises. They really can benefit from the 30-day invoicing by Ripple, and it is offered to them at a lower rate than if they were to go through a traditional lender like, let's say, a bank. Well, the, the, the XRP leases part of the business is interesting because um, something I've learned new as well. Um, these are ultimately sort of outstanding um, leases you've got going on in Q3, uh, Q3 around 35 million worth of, of XRP outstanding. Just are you expecting to be able to, to get that back in the current market environment? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, we, we did have some exposure to FTX. Yeah. I, I think. I think we publicly shared before there was around uh, just over $10 million of XRP we had leased to uh, FTX that they used for various things on FTX. You know, what we get back from that, I have no idea. The, the, the alleged fraud. Uh, I, you know, we'll see how the bankruptcy stuff plays out. And as I said, you know, re regardless of that, again, some companies were way overexposed and I think found themselves in a very stressful situation because they had too much exposure, too much debt. Uh, too many of those types of things. And for us, you know, that I think represented about 1% of liquid assets. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, I mean, I would rather not lose that money. And I'm hopeful that through the bankruptcy process, we get some or all of it back, but uh, it's not too consequential to the business. This next clip 
is really focusing on Ripple's position when it comes to hiring. They're still building their team and the Ripple corporate website shows that there are 69 open positions. Now, too many positions open is not always such a good thing. That usually translates to internal trouble. Projects go slower. Employee satisfaction is often lower due to not enough hands on deck, etc. But with today's crypto scale back, many people have lost their jobs. So the pool of talent is larger, really much larger than let's say 18 months ago. So this would mean lower cost for companies, especially in technology, who have often signing bonuses to attract that talent. And something you might have also heard is that bear markets are for building. Well, that is because a lot of people who've lost their job will use their personal networks to hook up with people that they've worked with in the past or people in the same sector that they are in and they launch new businesses. So this is why a lot of innovation is born during a bear market. And the people who are building new companies are also competing against those companies who are trying to grab their talent. It is a very interesting dynamic. All right, let's listen to this next clip. Well, we publicly, when the kind of layoffs in crypto started, we publicly announced we're still hiring. I think in Q2 last year, we hired 100 people. In Q3, we hired 100 people. Q4 is a little less than that, partly because of the holidays. You know, I, I, we have no plans to do any layoffs. Uh, we're going to continue to grow and hire. And again, that, that's just, so we sign more customers. We need more people to support those customers. We need, uh, we're obviously building, well, not obviously, we're building new products that we are excited about. And even, you know, the conversations I've had here in Davos, you know, we have cus existing customers coming to us wanting help with other elements of the kind of crypto ecosystem. Uh, so, like, you know, 2022, I think, will go down in history as a one of the worst for crypto. But... I think we lose sight. And I, I was at a, a panel that you and I chatted a little bit about yesterday where someone was saying, well, $2 trillion of crypto evaporated. Well, between Facebook and Tesla, $2 trillion evaporated last year. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. You know, add Tesla, Facebook, and Amazon, you for sure get $2 trillion. No one's claiming we shouldn't continue to invest in those companies. Hmm. You know, I, I think it's clear that low interest rates had driven a lot of froth in macro markets. And as interest rates have, uh, the, the direction of travel and interest rates changed in the spring of 2022, lots of asset classes hit reset. We obviously saw some bad actors in crypto uh, and that added to the contagion. Now this clip shifts to regulation and it doesn't look like to me, there's going to be a settlement. It appears that the SEC is still not allowing XRP to be in the wild unless it is a security. And when the clip ends, I'm going to let it continue out with Hester Peirce. She was on Cudlow just about two weeks ago, shortly after they launched the suit against FTX. Have a close listen. Let's, uh, we've got about five minutes left, so let's pick up on, on regulation and, and particularly first th this lawsuit you've got going on. Uh, Wait, what, what lawsuit? The, you know, <laughs> that one. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. That lawsuit with the SEC? Um, I remember that so, one. So that's still ongoing. Yes. Um, how are you expecting to be resolved? Are you expecting to, to reach a settlement with the SEC or just let the judge decide on this one? So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're now two years and two months in there, two years and one month into the lawsuit. Uh, SEC filed suit against us saying that our sales of XRP represented sales of unregistered securities. And, it, you know, from the beginning, I thought it was very clear that the facts were on our side and the law was on our side. And I think as you have seen this play out and you've seen the filings in the court that, you know, the, the judge certainly is hearing our arguments. Uh, there's been, I think, the SEC's behavior and some of it has been, uh, I don't know, I, I would say embarrassing as a U.S. citizen that, that, you know, just some of the things you've seen happen, you're like, you've got to be kidding uh, but look, it, it's now fully filed and fully briefed uh, in front of the judge in the second district. And we expect a decision from the judge, certainly in 2023. Uh, but you, you don't really have any control over when a judge makes uh, their decisions. And I'm optimistic that, you know, sometime in the coming single digit number of months, we'll, we'll have closure there. To your question about settlement, I mean, the, the problem here is the SEC, in particular Gary Gensler, has articulated a view that all crypto is a security. The only way that Ripple would settle, and I've, I've, I've said this at the very beginning, the only way we would settle is if there's clarity that XRP is not a security on a go-forward basis. 
if we, if there's, I mean, so you have this conundrum where the SEC is saying all crypto is a security. We're saying there's only a settlement if we can say XRP is not a security on a go-forward basis. So the Venn diagram for settlement is, I think, zero. So I, I think we're going to end up letting the judge decide, and I'm very optimistic. And I think, it, and I think people here in this audience know, and here at Davos know, this case is very important to crypto, not just for Ripple. It's for, for the whole industry. And I think that the fight that we've been fighting really, in some ways, has been for the whole industry. Yeah. And, and in terms of the SEC specifically, you've been critical of the way the U.S. has approached regulation towards the industry. Uh, what exactly you know, are you concerned about and, and why are you critical of the way the U.S. has approached? Well, I mean, two things. One, you know, something called regulation through enforcement is never a particularly efficient way to regulate, right? If you want to regulate, do the work, write the rules, codify the rules. And, you know, when, when a company comes to you and says, hey, help me understand the rules, I want to make sure we're following the rules, help them understand the rules. You know, I met personally with the SEC three times. Not once in those meetings did the SEC ever say to me, hey, and by the way, we're totally transparent about what we're doing. Not once did the SEC say, hey, we think XRP might be a security. So then for the later on to go back and say, hey, the whole time we thought XRP was a security, we just didn't tell you. That doesn't feel like a, a, a genuine uh, you know, partnership between public sector and private sector. Moreover, and you know, some of this stuff I'll be more uh, vague about because some of this stuff it hasn't been public yet. But yeah, there's something called the Hinman email. You know, Bill Hinman, the director of corporate finance at the SEC, gave a speech in June 2018 about how ETH had been a security, but had magically become not a security. And uh, there's some emails associated with that that the judge ordered turned over six times. We finally did get those emails. And I think when those come to light, I think you will see more kind of like, how is it possible the SEC decided to bring a case against Ripple given what they were saying within their own walls? Well, I really can't say more than, you know, the suit speaks for itself. If you lie to investors, um, you can face a lawsuit from us. But I think your broader point about crypto regulation is a really good one, right? This is a moment for us to sit down and think about what we've done wrong on crypto regulation. You can't solve the, the problems by just bringing one-off enforcement actions. You have to think about a framework within which you can regulate crypto properly. And we have to remember that bad things happen at centralized intermediaries. That's, that's the story of traditional finance, and that's true if you import that into crypt the crypto world as well. The crypto world is actually about decentralization. Well, I don't want to be uh, rude um, or anything like that. But Hester, I don't think the SEC knows much of anything about crypto, but I want to add to that, this is just me talking, I don't think the SEC knows much about climate or the environment. It's not the Securities and Environment Commission, it's the Securities and Exchange Commission. And as you just gave a speech, where did you give this speech? Was it AI that I was reading? It was AI. In uh, James Freeman's column. Um, these new climate regulations would basically tell companies how to run. And there's no law that has ever passed on that point. Yeah, we're the, we're the Securities and Everything Commission now. And, and I think that the point is that we're, we're couching this as a disclosure rule, telling companies what they have to disclose. But if you look behind the veil and you look at what we're actually doing, we're, we're getting into the business of companies and telling them how they have to think about business, how they have to think about their supply chain, how they have to run themselves. And that's obviously problematic because, as you said, we're not the experts here. Um, we, don't, we aren't an environmental regulator, and we certainly don't know how to, to, to run a business. Government regulators aren't meant to do that. Hester was throwing a lot of shade on the SEC. Basically, it translates to voicing her opinion about Gary Gensler. Now, when I posted that on Twitter, a lot of people are quite critical, uh, calling her out, saying that she should have blown the whistle and and that she's complacent and, uh, well, just, you know, people are frustrated. I think Hester is being strategic. She's a fighter, and I believe she's waiting for the timing, and she just hasn't found that open window yet where she's going to be most effective to make the change. If she wasn't a fighter, she would have left. I mean, she's had a lot of her fellow fellow commissioners leave. And I think she's hanging in 
for the long haul. And just maybe, just maybe she's got a shot at coming out a real winner. Let's wait and see. All right, everybody, we're jumping to the fluff. We're going to Mercari. I got the question asked of me today. So where can I find a Tokai guitar? Because it is something somebody is collecting. They live in the Bay Area and there, there's not a lot of large selection of this vintage guitar. And uh, so I said, well, gosh, right now everybody is buying and selling on Mercati. Let's take a look. And sure enough, lots of these Tokai vintage guitars. So that's interesting. I hope that it uh, works as a good source. Let me show you what I collect. I love the vintage Kanzashi. The Kanzashi was worn during the Edo period, uh, through the Meiji period, Taisho and early Showa. And of course it's still worn today, but only for a special occasion. These are the hair ornaments that really just bring such a refined, classy look to the hairstyle that is traditional when you wear a kimono. So many of the Kanzashi are made of urushi, which is lacquer. But you'll also find a lot of very rare uh, inlay like abalone and they're just so beautiful so the supply is getting low the demand is getting high and the prices are going up if you happen to go onto the website and put in samurai well you're going to come up with a whole lot of perfume <laughs> so if you use this site and you want to find your desired item, you're going to have to use kanji and just go to Google, type it in English, then translate to Japanese and then copy and paste into the search. The kanji for samurai is bushi and yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff in the bushi category. This is one that I was attracted to. It's a complete set of six little figurines. All right, everybody do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.